Hello. I would like to start this evening with the man that made this all possible, the one man. He's one of the most influential men on the planet today. Um, when I grew up in London, I had a friend from Pakistan, and when I was eight years old, it was a light bulb moment when I discovered that Ibrahim and Abraham were in fact the same person. And it took me a while to really internalize this. So um, I would like each of you to introduce yourselves and if you have a similar light bulb moment when that happened, or maybe if you would like to share your first dialogue with someone from another faith. Um, if we start with you, Your Excellency, Mr. Wazani. Thank you very much. Thank you for, I don't know if you, uh, I'm well heard. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, this uh, inviting us uh, in such high-level panel and uh, um, very holy moment, I may say, uh, in, the, in addition to that, uh, one hour before breaking the fast. So quite, let's say, challenging, <laughs> but always we are uh, used to the challenging time with the ambassador of Israel. <laughs> and uh, thank you for this invitation and we'll be, of course, uh, always supporting your initiatives. Uh, this, this moment and this month is a, is a holy month for, for this and the Muslim. But I, if I may say, it's not only and uh, exclusively a Muslim month. Because our uh, tradition, and uh, according to what has been said in the text, so the, this holy month witnessed many, let's say, books of uh, um, from Abraham's, then the First Testament as well, and um, uh, the New Testament, and uh, as well the, uh, the Quran. So for us, it's real, um, all religion together moment, not only Muslim uh, uh, month. So it's, it's, uh, for us, it's really holy month, and I'm very glad to share this very um, key moment with, with you all here. Uh, my personal, I'm presenting myself quickly, I'm chargé d'affaires at Moroccan Mission to the EU. My generation uh, witnessed a lot of moments. And uh, I, I grew up in a city in Morocco where I was in a class with uh, uh, friends and brother, if I may say. Uh, from different region, region, and my neighbor was Jewish. He was he was a, a son of a doctor, and we were together in the class. So even the, for me, the question is about: Is there any exception? I think it was a normal daily life that we were witnessing. So, uh, of course, we when we then we start to follow the politics and the uh, issues and, uh, and the more international context, it comes to be quite different. But honestly, we have in Morocco the, the, the areas uh, of uh, the Jewish areas we call the Melah. We'll talk later on about this issue. But for me, and my personal experience, and as well my sister, that is doctor today, we grow up with uh, friends and brother with, uh, uh, that are Jewish. I can give you names, but uh, <laughs> maybe after the meeting. <laughs> that, that's wonderful. We'll, we'll talk about that later on in the discussion, I'm sure. Um, Your Excellency, Mr. Gittenstein, uh, would you like to just introduce yourself briefly and maybe if you have any moments with your first dialogue with a Muslim person, if you could share them? <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, uh, Your Excellencies. Um, members of the Jewish and the Muslim community, thanks for having me. Um, if you don't mind and indulge me for a minute, I have a few remarks I'd like to make, and I'd like to dedicate them uh, to my late brother-in-law who was Palestinian, okay? Uh, he died in October. Uh, he left Sfad in 1948 and never returned. Uh, 
you is a wonderful, warm, passionate uh, man who adored my sister. Uh, and he died tragically in October. Libby and I, my wife and I, went to Svard in 2017 and we found his ancestral home. And I called him and on the phone, uh, tried to convince him in the coming months uh, to return and he never did. I talked to him at length over 40 years about peace in the Middle East um, and about a peace, a long uh, and sustainable peace that would protect not only Israelis but Palestinians. And he deeply believed in that. He strongly supported the Camp David Accords. I never talked to him about the Abraham Accords, which I'm disappointed to say, but I know what he would have thought. He um, would have wanted to see the Abraham Accords and the Camp David Accords extended to all the Middle East and particularly to protect and bring justice not only to Palestinians but to Israelis. Um, and he didn't live to see that. I firmly believe that the people in this room will live to see that. Um, and I am by nature an optimist, and I deeply believe in the words of my hero, Dr. Martin Luther King, who used to say the arc of history bends towards justice. So I think all of us in this room will one day celebrate a new set of accords that will bring lasting peace and end the suffering uh, to people on both sides of the Jordan River. Um, so with that, uh, Ramadan Karim. Thank you very much, Mr. Kittenstein. Your Excellency, Mr. Al Sahlawi, um, please introduce yourself. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Sarah. And uh, I would like to thank uh, this beautiful event and uh, everyone who took time to join us to break the fast with, uh, with, uh, with the Muslims here. Um, I think I don't, I mean, I'm not going to introduce myself after you introduced me, but uh, uh, I would like to just, uh, you know, share some, uh, some stories of where I come from, Dubai. Dubai, which is a city, I'm, I'm from United Arab Emirates, but I'm, I'm, I'm from Dubai, grew up there all my life. Uh, for us in Dubai, meeting with people from different religions, different backgrounds, different sects, is something very normal. It is something that we grew up with. Uh, for me, growing up, uh, looking at a mosque, a church, and a Hindu temple was something very organic and normal. Uh, I would like to highlight, though, a Jewish synagogue was missing, was not there, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm so happy and fortunate that I got to live and see that we are building, or we just completed building the first synagogue in the Arabian Peninsula, and that the UAE now is home to a thriving Jewish community. Thank you very much. <laughs> Your Excellency, uh, last but not least, Ms. Regev, you. if you'd like to introduce yourself and share a moment when you had your dialogue with a, a Muslim okay. friend. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having us uh, here. Uh, first of all, Ramadan Karim, Kul Amu Antum Bekher. I speak a little bit this language since I'm 30, almost 30 years in this business. Um, uh, in my last capacity job at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I was the head of Middle East Division for five years, so, so I run the relation with the Arab world, with the regime for years. Uh, so for 30 years, almost 30 years, I have iftars. Uh, so I'm less excited from that, but I'm very excited from the fact that it's public. It's something that you, for me, for us, uh, that we sit here together with my uh, Moroccan friends and colleagues, and Emirati and Bahraini, and this is really something different. Uh, my first experience, our first experience, uh, we just got married. Uh, my wife is here with me, Sharon. We flew to Muscat, Oman, and I had the honor to open the first Israeli mission in the Gulf. 
in Oman. Uh, it was in, thank you. And uh, we live next to a mosque. <laughs> and you know, five times a day, uh, there is a call by the muazin for a prayer, Allah Akbar, and people come and pray. It took us time to adjust, and then our baby born was, our first uh, child was born, and we succeed to adjust his breastfeed into the five times that the Mozin is calling for prayer. <laughs> so for us, we were young parents, and it was a good sign. This is about time to let the baby eat something. So this was my first interfaith uh, real experience. So once again, thank you very much for having us, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's a <laughs> it's exactly one year since the Negev summit when history was made and six leaders from Bahrain, Morocco, Egypt, Sudan, United Arab Emirates and Israel all met together. And they chose to meet near Steboker, which is the birthplace of Ben Gurion, who once famously looked at this dusty, sandy, arid landscape and said, let the desert bloom. And in a similar way, since the Abraham Accords have been signed, we've seen this incredible, uh, all these collaborations from such a wide range of fields, from football to music to cybersecurity, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask Your Excellency, Mr. Regev, what has been the standout collaboration that you've seen in these last two and a half years? Um, as I told you, I, I am in this business, but most of my years was, let's say, in, in, from behind closed doors. And I have to tell you, despite the experience that I have, despite the interaction that I had with my colleague from, from Emirates, Bahrain, Oman, and other places, I didn't anticipate <coughs> Uh, the openness and, and the way that it will be uh, conducted. Which means, once the leader, it was led by uh, 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 His Majesty, the Amir of, of, uh, of uh, the President, sorry, the President of Emirates, His was Highness, His Highness <laughs> that led this first. Um, and we saw it coming, but I did not anticipate that it will be such a breakthrough in a way that everything was open towards Israel. <clears throat> Everything, it's, it's a real peace. We see that, that the people from Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, came in a good faith and in, 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 a, in a new approach that came, it's bottom up, up bottom, people are really all around, they, there are no limits in the thing that we are doing today, in, in the relation that we have today. It's a real peace, I think we, 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 we study Oh, uh, and we had experience with peace with Jordan and Egypt, and I see it as a different kind of peace. So we see it. Uh, we see in the last two years, more than half million Israelis who visit Emirat, uh, dozens of uh, uh, thousands of Emiratis came to Israel from Bahrain, from Morocco, um, trade, investment. So it's cross the board. It's something that, as I mentioned, I didn't anticipate that. After two years, we will be at the position that we are today. And, and if you had to pick a standout collaboration from one of those, from that breath, which one would it be? I think the fact that the, the Israeli Philomeni play music in Abu Dhabi, and we have a music band, in, a band in, 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 in Morocco as well, the fact that culturally uh, those countries are open to accept that this is something that really touched my heart. Thank you. Uh, Dubai and Tel Aviv are famous around the world for being startup nations where anything is possible. And as Mr. Egev has said, there's been this amazing flurry of tourists uh, between Israel and Dubai. Uh, there are now more kosher restaurants in Dubai than here in Brussels, that's for certain. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about two. <laughs> um, what, what have been the highlights of this trade partnership uh, between Israel and the United Emirates, Mr. Uh, Your Excellency? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sarah. I mean, uh, Dubai and Tel Aviv are two of the most, or two 
of the most yeah, dynamic cities in the Middle East. And for more than 70 years, there was no collaboration between those two dynamic cities. So imagine when, uh, after the Abrahamic Accords, having those two power cities, which are both uh, startup nation, start nations, but also a trade hubs and technology hubs. When you're talking about a technology city in the Middle East, it's only Tel Aviv or Dubai that comes to mind. So imagine two of the most dynamic economies in the Middle East coming together, choosing cooperation rather than confrontation. Of course, that will deliver a lot of uh, innovative ideas, creative, uh, and, and, and solidify connectivity within the region. Um, Ambassador Ragav have, 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 have mentioned how uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the peace with the United Arab Emirates, uh, how it was very different from the peace with Egypt and Jordan. And I wanted to add that we made it very clear that we wanted this, the peace, peace with Israel to be a warm peace not a cold one. And we intentionally wanted it to be people-led as well. So I think when you say there are more kosher restaurants in, in United Arab Emirates than Brussels, that's a proof that, you know, after, after so many years of not talking to each other, I think there is a lot of um, uh, curiosity uh, to learn more about each other to know more about each other. And uh, I guess uh, food is the easiest way to do so. <laughs> um, water scarcity in the region is a frightening issue and it knows no borders. Uh, the Middle East and North Africa have some of the harshest climates in the world. Uh, and Morocco and Israel are now coordinating on the water issue in many ways, which is very exciting to watch. Israel has incredible desalination technology and Morocco has a wealth of experience building dams and water management. Um, how has that collaboration impacted Morocco? And what are some of the other ways that you've been able to cooperate? Mm. Mr. Wazir. Thank you for the, for the question. In, indeed, uh, since we have signed this uh, trilateral, uh, tripartite, tripartite uh, declaration between the United States, Israel, and Morocco on December 2020, we started, uh, as you may know, uh, we, we re-established our relation with Israel that existed before. Uh, it was a reopening and uh, formalizing uh, our relations. And uh, uh, the ties between the two uh, countries are uh, even, were all, always <coughs> strong, even before this uh, formal uh, uh, re-establishment of the relation. I, I, want, I want to say, that we have witnessed a lot of intense visits and exchange on the high level uh, on the governmental side, but as well on private sector and universities exchange and uh, agreements. We, have, uh, we, we managed to sign more than 40 agreements in different level and different uh, dimensions and fields, uh, including health, tourism, agriculture, water, uh, as well as um, uh, different um, fields of priority. Second, um, you know, in addition to the agreement, we have witnessed more than 12 high-level official visits from both sides, uh, which is uh, very important in one year and a half, and two, two years now. And um, I can give you some examples. Yes, concrete. please. Uh, maybe the most, um, let's say, uh, symbolic but very uh, tangible uh, example is the, um, the direct lines, flight uh, connection between Israel and Morocco. 
uh, you may know that we have uh, almost one million Israeli of the Moroccan origin in Israel, and uh, they they pay the visit. So before they passed by other countries to come to Morocco, now they have the possibility to come to visit their ancestors, their their families, relatives, and uh, uh, different cities uh, of Morocco. This is good for tourism, but good as well for the rapprochement between the two uh, populations. Um, in terms of universities, exchange as well. So we have that uh, cooperation between our uh, university and the researchers and the uh, Israeli uh, youth as well. So they can have, they can follow training program together and uh, study together, which is uh, quite, uh, I mean, uh, key and important to prepare the future generation to work together and to understand each other. Uh, this is some examples in water, and you know that uh, building on a very strong cooperation and long-standing partnership that we have with the EU, uh, more than half century of cooperation and trade and different uh, fields. We have, thanks to the very strong involvement of the Ambassador Regev, uh, here in Brussels, we have uh, started, um, um, I mean, to, for, to initiate and to launch a trilateral cooperation between the EU, so the uh, European Commission, the Genier, and uh, the Moroccan authorities in charge of water and uh, the Israeli counterpart. This has been announced just beginning of the, this month, a few, few weeks ago, by the Commissioner Vaili in Rabat when he was building a visit, working visit there, and uh, a an, uh, letter of intent would be signed uh, soon between all, this, uh, all the three uh, countries. So it will concern water management and uh, sharing expertise as well, and as well facilitating investment in, uh, in these uh, different uh, fields. I'm not expert on water management, to be honest. But I can tell you that our experts are working very hard. And the last meeting was in the beginning of March. And we are following with a very, let's say, uh, uh, interested uh, way uh, from Brussels to allow this uh, tangible uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. It's not just trade and economic partnerships that have bloomed since the Abraham Accords were signed. This month, the Abrahamic family house in Abu Dhabi was inaugurated. Nahama mentioned it. And if you haven't seen the pictures, I really encourage you to do so. It's the most stunning complex of a mosque, a church, and a synagogue, all built in the same stone with interconnected gardens. It's absolutely beautiful. I can't wait to visit it. But. Um, I'd like to ask Your Excellency, Mr. Al Sahlawi, um, how have the Abraham Accords translated into people-to-people -people contacts between the Emiratis and the Israelis? And the Israelis. I mean, um, Ambassador Ambassador Regev have highlighted few numbers. More than uh, half a million Israelis in the past year have visited. The, the United Arab Emirates. We have a smaller population, so the numbers will not will not uh, match those numbers, but they are in thousands. I think the people to people connectivity and connections is 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 um, can be measured through what has been achieved since the Abrahamic Accords were signed: a free trade agreement, more than. Eight daily flights between Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Tel Aviv, between all national carriers, a visa waiver, a recognition, mutual recognition of driving license, so now I can drive freely in Israel without having to go through any hurdles, and the same thing for Israeli citizens, a thriving Jewish community in uh, the United Arab Emirates, synagogues are being built, kosher restaurants are being established, and uh, it's becoming part more potent in, 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 in the region. And 
uh, for the UAE. Additionally, of course, you mentioned some, you know, uh, sports exchange programs, academic exchange programs. I mean, it's very, really very hard to follow uh, how quickly all the relationship is developing at all levels, once again, with, between the United Arab Emirates and uh, Israel. Um, I'd like to go back to something that you said, Mr. Wazani. Morocco has always had this thriving Jewish population, and uh, there are hundreds and thousands of Israelis with Moroccan heritage, but they're also very proud of those roots in Morocco. Um, and the relationship between Jews and Arabs is so profound and warm and genuine. It's not just cooperation on, on these issues like water, but it's at a fundamental level within Morocco. So I'd like to ask you, how have you achieved this level of tolerance and respect between Jews and Arabs all the way through? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, it's uh, hard to to answer quickly to this uh, very huge question. I mean, Take uh, your time. We, the fast <laughs> doesn't end till 8.10. <laughs> <laughs> we still have time before breaking the fast. We are right. Um, uh, our tradition, history, and architecture, when you go, when you visit the long streets in Morocco, can, from Meknes, Fez, I saw tables with the names of cities in Morocco, which I uh, really like the, the, the attention. But I mean, we, we have this heritage in terms of architecture, but as well, um, this is one of, uh, I may say, the specificity of the Moroccan model when it comes to its relation with its Jewish uh, community and Jewish in general. Um, I can give you, of course, uh, figures, but I would like to concentrate on three or four examples. First, uh, we still have important minorities, and Jewish minority, uh, thousand, let's say that three or four thousand uh, people living, still living in, in Morocco. Um, we have, uh, in addition to what I said, uh, one million uh, uh, Moroccan origin uh, living in Israel. Uh, the, this is the, this is the, I can may say, uh, in Morocco, we can find uh, courts that uh, that are, I mean, uh, Hebrew courts. Sorry if I'm, they they, they call it Hebrew courts. Courts. We have schools as well. Uh, one of the main main Jewish school is in, is in Casablanca, which is called Maimonid. Uh, uh, Maimonid, uh, everybody knows who is Maimonid, the f philosopher and uh, uh, physician that, that studied in Qarawin University in the 12th century in Fez. Uh, we have as well um, in our constitution since 2011 uh, this uh, DNA of uh, the, and the heritage of the Jewish heritage. It's a part of our DNA, of, part of our identity, if I may say. And uh, nobody in Morocco questioned the, how uh, you, I mean, open the direct flight between Morocco and Israel. Nobody questioned and uh, 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 how come that you are, um, uh, have this, this relation and ties, because we grow up with this identity. And it's, it, it is more than the legal. And uh, the, of course, our His Majesty the King is one of the main supporters of this, uh, uh, of strengthening, uh, strengthening our relations uh, with the, the Jewish community. I will give you just, if I may, two or three uh, examples as well of uh, the institutions that have been created to promote Hebrew as a component of the rich Moroccan culture. There is the National Council of Moroccan Jewish Community, which would ensure in management of community, community affairs and safeguarding. The Commission of Moroccan Jews Abroad, 
Uh, it works to examine the links and Moroccan Jews established abroad with their country of origin, as well as the foundation of Moroccan uh, Judaism. Uh, that mission is to promote and watch over the Judeo-American and intangible heritage. All these important achievements testify on the very specificity on the Moroccan experience and coexistence uh, between Muslim and Jewish communities in the country and beyond. Thank you very much. Um, my grandparents grew up in Baghdad in Iraq. I think there's some other Iraqis here tonight. Um, but in their time, 100 years ago, the word coexistence did not exist. There was just no such thing. It was just existence. So Jewish, Christian, Muslim communities, like in Morocco today, just lived together. They worked together. They celebrated each other's festivals. And the Abraham Accords has radically reversed this narrative that Jews and Muslims are enemies and adversaries. And also the EJCC's Dialogue and Diversity is also doing so much valuable work to address that stereotype as well. I'd like to ask Your Excellency, Mr. Gittenstein, are you ever surprised at how quickly we've been able to put that past behind us in these two and a half years? No, not really. Um, you know, I think there's a reason the Abraham Accords are called the Abraham Accords. It's because of the common lineage of the Muslim and Jewish traditions. Abraham, father of both religions. And I think that when leaders and diplomats focus on what we have in common instead of what we have uh, in the differences between ourselves, anything is possible. And I give credit to the Trump administration and, uh, and the Israelis and the signers of this agreement because that's what they did. If we continue to do this, uh, Sami Asadi's dream will come true. And uh, it's not surprising uh, because it's the nature of, of humanity. You know, our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, right before the Civil War, in his first inaugural, tried to bring peace before the war started with the phrase that he would call upon the better angels of our nature to bring peace. Eventually he did, it had, to, it had took force, but uh, we have reached peace in the United States over these issues because we called upon the better angels, with the common values that we have. Now there are many uh, forces that, uh, alive in our politics, in your politics, and in world politics that divide us, and we have to get above those. If we do, it's not surprising at all that we because we're all human beings, and we want peace. I love that answer. <laughs> uh, let me just please correct you. I don't think that the Muslims saw the Jews as, as their enemy. Uh, my mother grew up in Morocco, my father in Iraq, and in Morocco, uh, you know, they, had, they, had, they got a lot of respect from the local community, as well as in Iraq. In the early 40s, and especially after the establishment of the State of Israel, it's become more complicated. They were not equal. But I, I think that at the Islam there is a respect, I don't think, I know that there is respect for Judaism. So it's not that we start from scratch as an enemy, that, uh, that there, was, there is a base for that, for this reconciliation. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I'm not that happy. <laughs> no, as a Muslim. <laughs> as a Muslim, of course, of course. There was never this, uh, uh, you know, uh, lack of respect because uh, respecting the Abraham religions is something very important for all Muslims to follow. Uh, now, absolutely. I think it's more the stereotype that sometimes you read about in the press that, you know, the two of warring... Course. Uh, of course, of course. And of adversaries, course... Adversaries, well, not adversaries, not enemies, let's of say. Of course, and then you will find always some, you know, extremists that would like to uh, highlight on the differences and exploit that for different ideologies and agendas. Yeah. Thank you.
Uh, success is in the eye of the beholder, and it can be measured in so many ways, as we've just heard. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Egev, you were involved in the Abraham Accords long before they were signed in September 2020. Did you ever predict this amount of enthusiasm that we have today? Um, no, as I say, I, 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 I was... Um I anticipate and I saw that there is a good base, a good um, ground to, 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 to have, a, 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 a have an excellent relation and, 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 and contacts. But as I mentioned, I did not anticipate that we, we, get, we, we will be at the point that, uh, that we are, are today. Today, our uh, relation and, and discussion with the Emirates, with Bahrain, with Morocco goes, goes much behind bilateral. Uh, today we discuss with the Emiratis uh, joint uh, venture, maybe in Africa, in the Far East, with Morocco in Africa. So we go, it goes behind. So people to people, we are there already. Uh, culture, we are there. Uh, trade, of course, we are there. Uh, government, defense, you know, we, we, we can also discuss this. We, we have many shared interests and challenges in the region. So we, we today jointly discuss those challenges. Uh, from Iran, from, from, from terror, from others. So, so our relation, uh, as my friend and colleague here described, are wide uh, all over the court. And, and, and again, we, we nurtured those relations secretly behind closed doors for years. And suddenly, from, it's blooming. It's really blooming. So I'm, I'm really happy with that. Um, before I got married, I kept hearing, marriage is hard work, you have to work at your marriage. And I would always wonder, what on earth is this work? I've done the marriage, now we can just sit back and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But um, there is this immense energy and momentum at the moment for the Abraham Accords. But how do we maintain it? What, what are the challenges of keeping this warmth that we're seeing today in the partnerships forever? Uh, I'd really like to ask all of you that, but I think we're running out of time, so maybe I can ask Your Excellency, Mr. Al Sahlawi. I mean, in any healthier, and you mentioned marriage. I'm not married, but uh, <laughs> um, I can tell in any relationship there will be some challenges. That's it's just not normal not to have any sort of challenges in any relationship, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a partnership whether it is a marriage. So uh, I think the important thing is prioritizing uh, cooperation, focusing on areas that we see eye to eye on uh, and make that the driver of the relationship as opposed to focusing on areas that we wouldn't necessarily agree on anytime soon or for the foreseeable future. So let's focus on what the commonalities build up on that, solidify it through different, the Negev Forum is one platform that was able to go beyond the countries that signed the Abrahamic Accords, the I2, U2, another platform that included India in the, uh, uh, the Abrahamic Accords with the United States, with Israel, with the United Arab Emirates. So it's very important to have those initiatives as well, to solidify. And I remember a few years ago uh, when we were talking about uh, peace with Israel, and then how to quantify peace. And that's very hard to do, obviously. But I think if you gather the data from all of what we were able to achieve in the past two years, you can have some idea of what are the benefits of peace. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, we are running out of time, so, and I've still got many more questions, so I'll just have to skip a couple. But um, peace across the Middle East will always be in our prayers, but it's not, com it's not possible to ignore the threats that there are to stability and it, that's for all the countries in the region. So uh, what additional security to the region have the Abraham Accords brought, Your Excellency yeah. Mr. Regev? 
I, I think it's, it's a dramatic change. This, this kind, I mean, this aspect, I don't know how many of you are aware of, of, of this, this change. Uh, there is a difference if there is one country, one state that cope with challenges, like I mentioned, Iran and other, or if there is alliance. Israel is not, and, and the region, we are not going to turn into, into new net, NATO alliance, NATO alliance. But on the other hand, today you see uh, officers, high-level officers from Israel, Emirates, even other, other countries that we don't have uh, official relation, and discuss jointly how they cope with challenge. Because if there is, for example, a drone or missile that fires from, uh, let's say, Iran, he needs to cross several uh, borders, several lands. How together we cope with that? And we discuss those things. So once we share our know-how, knowledge, capabilities, then we can better uh, uh, cope with those, those challenges that actually are, we, we are both facing them. Uh, I remember that uh, you mentioned that you discussed peace with Israel uh, uh, years before we opened. I remember that the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we uh, write a list of challenges and interest, interest that Israel has. And we put the Arab states next to Israel, and we discover, surprisingly, that if we take the Israel interest and put in front, next to it, the, the Emirati interest, it was almost identical. Almost identical, and at this stage, we understand that, wow, there is something here that uh, to, to expect. Um, I see that we've got a little bit more space, and uh, over there and on this side. Do you see any other countries joining us for IFTAR next year? We can make that for even longer. Are you asking? <laughs> I'm asking all of you, actually, but we've only got time for a very quick. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Say inshallah. You mean more countries in the Middle East? Yeah, inshallah. Yeah. Oh, well, you're the experts on that. I would, I would hope that would be the case. Um, the United States will certainly support that. Um, I think the future of peace in the Middle East is a function of expanding both the Abraham Accords and the Camp David Accords. Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Ramadan is a time for hope and renewal, and as it's nearly time to break the fast, and I cannot go over schedule, I'd like to just conclude by asking your hopes for the next year, if we start with you, Mr. Wazani. Well, uh, if it's a uh, concluding, I mean, words, uh, it's very difficult to conclude on a very positive and the uh, peace mes uh, message. Uh, for us, this is how we see it. We look at it. And uh, uh, two days ago, the, the advisor of the, the, His Majesty the King, André Azoulay, uh, organized in Rabat a sort of iftar of peace. And uh, all religion, uh, religions, uh, they, are, um, they are invited together to share uh, meals, but as well, as well to, to have a dialogue. And I will quote him, if you allow me to read <laughs> exactly what he said. Uh, we want this path of peace to be taken by Palestinian children and Israeli children, so that one takes care of the other, takes care of the safety of the other, and so that together they can live which, with each other. Others in the same dignity, the same justice, and the same freedom. Beautiful. End of the call. <laughs> your Excellency, Mr. Al Sathlawi, uh, what are your hopes for next year? Well, I have a lot of hopes, but I think the most important uh, is uh, good health. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, I think uh, prosperity, peace, stability uh, in my region, we come out uh, a very, very hard decade in the region that was very challenging for every single person. It was a very scary time. And uh, I, would, I wouldn't want that 
uh, dark time to come back. We learned a lot of lessons. Uh, we paid a very high price, and I think uh, I, uh, that's why that will always be my priority, peace and stability in my region and the world, of course. Beautiful. Well, I wish you all a Ramadan Mubarak, oh. and thank you so much thank for you. all your contributions, Ambassadors.